Hello everyone. I would like to welcome you back to my channel once again. And just want to praise God for another beautiful day. Thank God we woke up this morning because of so many people did not. And we just want to use this opportunity as with all opportunities. We want to impact the world and we want to make a difference in the body of Christ as well as the world. So I want to discuss a few things that was um, on yesterday's video from Motivating You to Win. And the title of that video was called The Rising of Once Saved, Always Saved. The Rising of OSAS. So apparently, after all these years, motivating you to win is still so very deeply disturbed by the once saved, always saved doctrine. And which, by the way, uh, it's not a man-made doctrine. It's biblical. And it came through the mouths of the Apostle Paul and, and other um, apostles once they got on board, once they made the transition from works to grace. They all agreed. They were all in agreement. And this is what we want to do. We're trying to get the body of Christ on one accord. To be in agreement with what the Bible says. And it's very difficult to do this. Because we are wrestling with principalities, forces of darkness, and uh, this is the battle. I always said that the real battle was about that once saved, always saved doctrine. And it, it has so many people in bondage. You know, there are only two groups of people that exist today in our world. We have two groups of people. And I'm going to agree with uh, a part of Motivating You to Win's video when she said that that people, that we are spiritually dead. I agree with that. You don't come alive until the Holy Spirit comes in and quickens us. That's when we become alive. So basically, we are living in a world of zombies because they have not been quickened. So I agree with that part. And of course, I, I, I've, already, uh, I've already understood that concept anyway. But um, so we, we only have two groups of people in this world today. One is in Adam. The other is in Christ. One is in Adam and the other in Christ. And there is no in-between. There is no in-between. When you meet a person, either they are going to be in Christ or they're going to be in Adam. And that's just the way it is. What are, who are you in today? I'm asking a question to my audience. Are you in Adam or are you in Christ? And there is no in between. It's one or the other. And once you can establish that fact, the rest becomes easy. Because now you either know what you need to do next 
or you need to relax in where and who you are. I'm in Christ today and I'm in a good place. I'm comfortable. I'm relaxed. I am resting in the finished work of Christ. I am rejoicing. So that's the question we need to present to our world so that we can take the next step to make sure, to ensure that they get in Christ, that they make the transition. Okay, so let's move on here because uh, I don't want to be all day. It's a beautiful day out. Okay, so let's begin with her video, The Rising of the Once Saved, Always Saved. And of course, she refutes it with everything in her. And she is very appalled at the very idea that God would save people unconditionally. That's appalling to her. But I'm sorry, sis. That's just the way it is. Be thankful. Because I'm telling you, you would have been out of here a long time ago. You... You don't see the wrong. You you just don't understand this thing. I'm telling you, you're not perfect. Even when you think you're perfect and that you have uh, dotted every I, crossed every T, I'm telling you, you are not. You have still fallen short. You need this grace unconditionally. You need this. We need this. Or none of us would have any hope. And as I asked the question yesterday, uh, salvation, you know, salvation is a free gift. Now, if, if it's not secured, if you don't believe in eternal security, I just asked the question, what do you plan on doing in order to compensate and to appease God's wrath. I just want to know. I can't think of one earthly thing that we can present to God other than ourselves. And that's it. Uh, anyway, let's go to the... Uh, I'm having iced coffee today, so bear with me. I have to take a sip. At the 35 second mark, just the very beginning of her video, this is a long quote, I think it is, because I, I wanted to quote her, this the, everything she said starting out. And she says at the 35th second mark, she said, she says, I had a conversation last night friends. And this person said something that I found very interesting. A lot of people who believe once saved, always saved, often are the same people that do not believe in the administration of the Holy Ghost. I don't understand how you can be a follower of Jesus. You can be a worshiper of God in spirit and in truth. And you don't believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and the manifestations of the Holy Spirit are clearly listed in scripture. So let's just uh, unpack this for a minute. Okay, so she's discussing with a friend about the Holy Spirit and people that says once saved, always saved, how they do not understand the administration of the Holy Spirit. 
And how can they worship, be a worshiper of God in spirit and in truth, and you don't believe in the Holy Spirit? I don't know how to deal with that. Because a scripture just came to my mind, but I, you know what? As I'm reading this, I'm thinking about this scripture where it says that we, it is the Holy Spirit that leads us in the first place. So what is she talking about? Before any man can even acknowledge God, he has to be led of the Holy Spirit first. So there's the first attack on the once saved, always saved. We don't understand the administration of the Holy Spirit. And somewhere she missed the fact that we are sealed the moment we believe. So you can see she has a lot of figuring out to do. You can see that this motivating you to win with all the love in my heart, let me tell you this. You need a good teacher because what you are saying here, what you are believing, it just doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense. Yes, you need a good teacher. I don't care how your pronunciation is so wonderful. I don't care. You need a good teacher right now, right about now. And you need to stop while you're right. Right now, you need to stop in your tracks because you have people following this type of rhetoric. And then, okay, so let's move on. She continues to ramble and be on the attack about the once saved, always saved gospel. And, and then she begins to lay out for us the conditions for obtaining grace. And at the three minute and 35 second mark, she says, it is, it does cover you. In other words, she's saying it does, I'm going to quote her, it does cover you. Grace, she's talking about grace. It does cover you. You good. It does cover you, my friend. When, here's the condition, when, quote, when you walk with him, when you do exactly what Jesus taught. And see, there's the condition. So she has a condition for grace. Grace is not a free gift. Grace is what she has in her mind, and it's based on conditions. Because she said, when, when you walk with him, when you do exactly what Jesus taught, that's a false teaching. That is false because that's not what the Bible says. And I'm going to get into it further down because I got some scriptures that I'm going to share with the people my audience, and I hope you uh, will find comfort in these scriptures that I'm going to give you toward the end, and it's going to refute what she just said right here. So she has conditions for grace, and there are no conditions for grace motivating you to win. Then she goes on, she quotes Matthew 3.20, and it says, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of God. I'm sorry, wait, let me read this again. Repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's at hand. Jesus, these are his words. I'm quoting her. And we find in Matthew 4, 17, Still quoting. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then she says, here is the missing piece of the fake 
converts that that are all over YouTube, my friend. This is a twofold command here. He said, repent and do what? Turn to God, friend. You can't turn to God and still turn to the flesh. One or two are going to master us. So, yes, you can motivate you to win. You can actually turn to God and you can still turn to your flesh. And we do it every day. We do it all the time. Because you know the war that goes on with spirit and flesh. You know that. One minute, you want to be holier than thou. The next minute, you want to be the chiefest of sinners. In your mind, you may not act it out, but in your mind, I'm just saying. You could be praying the most beautiful prayers and next thing you know, a thought will come to your mind. An evil thought will come to your mind. And that's the very thing that God, that's the, the very thing that God judges, that thought. So you're just a little twisted motivating you to win. You're just a little twisted. And then at uh, nine, at the nine minute mark and 54 seconds, she says, uh, she goes on into her, Mocking voice and poking fun at the once saved, always saved doctrine. T poking fun at us. Telling us that we will come up short and we will be crushed out here. And I just want to say, I've been, yeah, since I left the kingdom church, but even when I was in the kingdom church that said you could lose your salvation, it all comes from kingdom. It is, that's kingdom teaching. And it says you can lose your salvation. And I lived that. I lived in agony. I lived in fear. Always worrying about losing my salvation. Never. I missed so many years. So many wonderful years that I could have been enjoying my salvation. My freedoms in Christ. So I lost a great deal of time. I lost years worrying. How well did I do? Did I miss the mark? Am I going to make it? Is God mad at me? Is God going to whip me? Well... Since I have come from under that teaching and which is why I feel the need to jump up on this platform, which is not an evil platform like motivating you to win seems to think. Since I have started believing the, the, the truth about God's grace toward mankind today under this dispensation, I just cannot tell you the joy, the freedoms that I have experienced. It's almost like a sigh of relief, to say the least. You can go to bed at night knowing God is pleased with me. My identity is in him and he's pleased with me because when he sees me, he sees Christ. I am a member of the body of Christ. God doesn't see me as a sinner, even though I'm not perfect, even though I may drop the ball every now and then, or sometimes more often than I like to admit to. But God doesn't see that. He sees me in Christ. He sees the blood. That's what I'm trying to drive home to my people. I don't want pe my people to fear. I don't want my sisters and brothers to fear. 
because you 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 don't have to. It's just like you know uh, when you when you when you get a headache and you just sit up there suffering and suffering. All you gotta do is take an aspirin, and you can alleviate that headache unless there's something deeper going on. But I'm just saying, why are you suffering when you don't have to? Why are you letting this woman and people of her persuasion entertain you with this nonsense? She did that whole video yesterday, but she never once told us. Well, wait a minute. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. I don't, I don't know at what, at what point, but she did say that we have an advocate with the father. She did say that. But you know what? I got a problem with that. Because you know what? You don't have to keep going back to the altar. Not the dispensation of grace. Not the one saved by grace. We don't have to go back to that altar. And you know what else? When you go to a church, there really shouldn't be any altars. Because the altar has been done away with. When the veil was rent, the altar was done away with. No more sacrifices. The sacrifice was completed. So, you know, you don't even have to keep going back to the altar over and over and over every time. Now, I just, just to, just to add a little grace to it. And a little freedoms to that. Some people, it helps their conscience to keep telling the Lord they're sorry. It helps their conscience. So we're not going to say don't ask, tell the Lord you're sorry. But just know that when you tell the Lord you're sorry, just know that you were already forgiven. Past, present, and the saints say, and future. <laughs> and future. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just the mailman, okay? I'm just the mailman. I'm giving y'all the mail. I'm giving y'all the good old gospel tea. Child. And future. He said, and future sins. So you don't have to keep going back to the... You're already forgiven. All you have to do is work on you and say, okay, I'm already forgiven. I know I, I need to come out of this. I need to start taking steps because I'm already forgiven. I got grace on my side. I just got to do the work in, in trying to just shake this thing. And you know what? I got some even better news. Even if you don't shake it, it's going to be a question or I would say it's going to be an issue at the uh, judgment seat of Christ. You, it's going to be handled there. Okay? It's going to be burnt up at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't want any of you to feel like when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, then you, you're you going to lose your salvation You because your roll book is going to look so bad that the Lord just might throw you into the lake of fire like motivating you to win said. <laughs> well, I've never heard her talk about the judgment seat of Christ. I have never. I mean, this, this woman, she is, she, she's just like, you're going straight to the, she, she's bypassing a lot of stops and she's going straight to the lake of fire, y'all. She's going straight to the lake of fire. No questions asked. That is so sad. But no, your salvation is secure. And just remember this. In order to get to the judgment seat of Christ, you have to be raptured first. So if, if you were raptured ready, if you are raptured ready, then that's that's an indication right there that you're saved or you're not going to be raptured. 
You're going to be left behind for the great tribulation. So I'm, look, I'm just trying to help everybody to get some perspective here. And so um, she's a scoffer. She scoffs at once saved, always saved. She cannot stand it that God would have so much grace and show so much love and grace and mercy for these wretched people like myself. That is so disturbing to her. And she's one of the recipients of such a grace. So, okay, so let's move on. Um, oh yeah, let's talk about this one where she says, uh, I don't know at what point, but it was following, it was right after this last one I quoted. So she mentions here that, uh, she's in agreement. Like, yeah, I know I read the scripture. No one can pluck us out of Jesus's hand. Now she's in agreement with that. But then she turned around in the same breath. And she says, yeah, that's true. But, she bought that but. But, you certainly can jump on out. Because I'm quoting her. Yeah, that's true. But you certainly can jump on out and have it your way. Oh, yes, yes, and yes. So, wow. And I guess... For her to see Christ as, to me, to make a statement like this, your Jesus must be very weak, that he doesn't have enough power in his hand to hold you, to keep you, that you got more strength and more power than Jesus, that you can just actually jump out of his hands. See, we're, we're trying to find out, what, how do you see Jesus? Do you see him as all powerful or do you see him as maybe got some flaws? Well, this is what we're trying to find out. For you to say that a person can jump, a saved person can jump out of the hands of Jesus. There's something going on that you need to check motivating you to win. Okay, you need to check that because uh, something's just not adding up with your gospel. So then she goes on, she's trying to, she's trying to avoid Paul, but she's going to bring up Acts because she knows that Acts, the book of Acts is after the cross, but she did not go any further than Acts 238, which again is not for the body of Christ. Remember Acts 238, that is Peter's gospel. Okay. That's not Paul's gospel. That is Peter's gospel. And it's the early fruit of the, the, the uh, dispensation of uh, the kingdom gospel. It, it's the phasing out period. So it hasn't phased out. It's still kind of fresh in Acts 2.38. It's still kingdom. And uh, Peter is uh, quoting in Acts 2.38, but now this is how she worded it. Okay, let me let me read it first, and then I'm going to go back and read it the way she read it. Acts 2.38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, well, she. This is how she worded it, Acts two thirty eight. Each of each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Well, remission of sins, forgiveness of sin. I need to look into that because I think there is a slight difference. Um. So. Each of you, see, this is what Eve did. 
Eve, she knew what Adam had told her, but she added. She said, we, we must not even touch it. So you see how she just like slipped something in there that it wasn't, it wasn't in the word. That's not the way Adam told her. She said, we can't even touch it. See, and here she, she said, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Turn to God. Of course, well, I'm, I mean, she didn't say anything wrong when it says turn to God, but it's just the idea of her not reading it verbatim the way it is in the Bible. And so Peter is saying in Acts 2.38, when you repent, be baptized. And by the way, baptism is a work. It is a work. You have to do something. And when you do, when you repent, when you be baptized, then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, what's different there? What's different is that you will not receive the Holy Ghost until you do A, B, and C. Now, how is that different from the body of Christ? Very different. Because the moment we believe, the moment we believe according to Ephesians 1 and 13, the moment we believe, we are sealed. We are baptized into the body of Christ. The moment we believe, we are sealed with the hope of promise. That's all the difference. That's a big, huge difference. So you see where, what she just quoted for the body of Christ, what we have to do, you can see clearly that does not add up to what Paul was saying in his gospel. Because we don't wait for the Holy Ghost. We don't wait to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We get the Holy Ghost the moment we believe. See, so these gospels are different. And so... She goes on and she never mentions anything about Paul's gospel. And Paul's gospel is the gospel in which we are to be saved according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 1 through 4. I know that is a very easy gospel and she cannot stand that gospel because if she did if she didn't have a problem with that gospel, she would be preaching that gospel. And that's the gospel that we're supposed to be preaching. When we come across someone who does not know Christ. We are to be teaching along those lines. And we are not to go back to Acts 2.38. Because that is not the gospel for the body of Christ. Under the dispensation of grace. So. God used Paul to reveal the mystery of the body of Christ. She wants nothing to do with that. God uh, God gave a different gospel to Paul for the Gentiles. And it would just be as simple as having faith in the blood of Jesus. Having faith in his blood. No works, no water baptism. So I just want to say to her, there is no such thing as obtaining grace with conditions. Because grace is just what it is. I mean, hey, do you want to go and, and search out your Webster dictionary? Grace is just what it is. Unmerited favor. Okay, so now we're going to go left. We're going to go into left field here at uh, in the 14 minute mark and 50 seconds. Um, here she is... Um, She's done. Uh, she's gone way into left field by associating the once saved, always saved group, which is my, like my group, because I believe once saved, always saved. She's trying to pair that my group up with um, the rump shaking booty. <laughs> goodness time out i need some oh i need some coffee mm. oh my gosh mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. 
Okay. Mm. Can I have a moment of silence? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me stop. Yeah, she's trying to... Uh, uh, mm, stop it. This girl is so funny. She's trying to uh, pair that up, pair us up with the rump shaking, booty shaking crowd who wears uh, a cross around their neck. I mean, motivating you to win. She's all up and down these social media, I want to say, jungles. And she's peeping through the bushes. Looking for all the rump shakers and booty shakers with the cross around their necks. And she's judging them and she's pairing them up saying, oh, these are the people that are uh, believing once saved, always say, look, you can't, you can't tie me into that. You, you can't tie me into that. But yet at the same time, you know, here she is jumping up and down on a donkey in front of a man with a uh, Daffy Duck costume on. Okay, and that's all, and that's okay. And, and she don't see no wrong in that. I told you, we got people in this world, they really don't think their stuff stinks. Everything they do, they think is golden. But boy, they got so much to say about other people. But I, I got news for you. Those rump shakers, if they are in Christ, they're going to meet you up there. If you go up there, they're going to meet you up there if they're in Christ. If you're in Christ, y'all going to meet and you can't get around it. I digress. Let's move on. Um, Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, if you want to read Ephesians chapter 5, um, read the whole chapter. It definitely lays out the principles um, concerning our conduct as a believer in Christ. You know, it definitely lays the foundation and it gives an, a wonderful pattern for us to follow. And it, it would not hurt to read it every day because it's about conduct. You know, how we are to conduct ourselves, how we're to carry ourselves, you know, how we are to treat one another. So Ephesians chapter 5, if everyone could read that every single day, it would help you a lot. Until you just get it deep down, you should read it. But even in reading it, I just want to say that it still does not, nowhere does it say, we will lose our salvation if we fail to miss the mark. Or if we fail or miss the mark. And that's Ephesians 5.30. No member, just keep in mind, no member of the body of Christ. No member. Remember, we are members of his body. And no member of the body of Christ will go to hell. Because Christ cannot deny himself. No member of the body of Christ will go to hell. And so let's see, um, Ephesians 1 and 13, uh, I'm going to give you a couple, mm, let's say three, and there's plenty more, but I'm going to give you three, and I think I've done it before many times, but I'm going to do it again, because it won't go away, and I have to keep reiterating, like she keeps reiterating, I have to keep reiterating as well, Ephesians 1 and 13. In Christ ye trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom ye believed. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Talking about the seal, once again, talking about the seal, not water baptism, and waiting to be filled with the Holy Spirit of promise. No waiting here. Okay? Don't you just love it? Don't you love going through the checkout aisles where there's no waiting? So surely you can appreciate that here as it relates 
to the seal of promise. Romans chapter 6 and 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what is the wages of, of, of sin? Death. What is the gift of God? Eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So where's the boasting? Where's the boasting? And so let's move on. Finally, motivating you to win gives her audience scriptures to meditate on, to read, to live. And it comes from the Old Testament Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the first part of Acts. All of which has nothing to do with the body of Christ. So, what she's trying to keep her people under, and unfortunately, they don't read their Bibles enough to know. I hope they watch my videos. Please share my video, because we got to get these people freed. Please share my video, for this reason alone. I'm going to bring them out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the first part of Acts because Paul's ministry had not started. And then, you know, uh, at the end of her video, she mentioned Paul. Paul didn't have anything to do with Acts 2.38. Paul was, his ministry hadn't started in Acts 2.38, okay? So she was in error there. If you go back and watch the video, you'll see what I mean. These books do not apply to the body of Christ. There's portions of Acts that do not apply to the body of Christ. When you rightly divide, you'll know what's for you. And it's not going to be until you get to the very end because that whole book is a transitioning book. These books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the book of Acts, the first part of Acts, were all addressed to a Jewish kingdom audience. How can you apply Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to the body of Christ? We weren't even there then, back then. We were not even, the mystery had not been revealed. We are a mystery, everybody. We are a mystery. And how can you apply, how can you attach Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and tell people to keep reading it? You and, and the people that, that, that are teaching uh, along with you, how can you apply Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the first parts, parts of Acts to the body of Christ? We were still in mystery mode. These books were for the Jews. And I did read Matthew, uh, okay, Matthew 15 and 24. What did Jesus say? Since you want to quote Jesus so much, didn't Jesus tell everybody that he only came for the Jews? He did not come for the Gentiles at that time during his ministry because Gentiles were considered dogs by God. They were unclean people. So now... After all this happened, crucifixion and everything, this was all before the cross. And she still wants to take people and take them way before the cross. And she wants to put them under Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the first part of Acts. I know Acts was after the cross, but that part, that was still the remnant from the kingdom. That was like a spillover from the kingdom. That was the fig tree. The, the, the uh, parable of the fig tree, that was that remnant. If you read the parable of the fig tree, that was that remnant where 
God was still striving with Israel. All the way up until the stoning of Stephen. Okay. And that's when they rejected the Holy Spirit. And that's when God said, I'm done. That's when, when the Lord said, I'm ready to bring my kingdom. I'm ready to judge. I'm ready to rule and reign. But then that's when God took that time out. So, yeah, so she's in error. Okay, she is in error. I have tried on many occasions to bring motivating you to win up to speed. Please share my video with her. And I'm going to uh, finish this out by going to Acts chapter 18 and verse 24. And I'm going to read. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus, verse 25. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit. He spoke and taught diligently the things of the Lord. Though he knew only the baptism of John, verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Aquila and Priscilla had heard him, they took him unto them and they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So what happened here? Apollos, he must have been a mighty, mighty good teacher. And he must have been a powerful teacher. His name was Apollos. And he spoke eloquently in the things of God. He must have been charismatic as well. But he only knew about the baptism of John. And as Aquila and Priscilla were listening and listening, and they thought, hmm. So after, I guess after the service, they took unto him, they took to him unto themselves and they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So, you know, as you can see here, if you uh, read further, because there's more to this, I just gave you these uh, three uh, verses. But as you continue to read, you will clearly see that this was a message of a transitioning from works, water baptism, into the grace gospel. Because this guy, he only knew the baptism of John. You had to be water baptized. But uh, Aquila and Priscilla, hey, they, paraphrasing, I'm paraphrasing. Hey, okay, yeah, you, you speak it real good, but now let us catch you up to speed. Let, let, you know, cause there's some knowledge that maybe you, you hadn't heard about, uh, through Paul concerning the gospel. So let us catch you up to speed and see, this is what happened here. And this is what my earnest plea for motivating you to win is, is to allow the members of the body of Christ, such as myself. To catch her up to speed and get her on the right timeline of where we are today under the dispensation of grace. She's no different than Apollos. She speaks eloquently. She speaks, she has a, a, a strong, fiery, boisterous voice. However, there's some new knowledge that has been given to us. And apparently, 
She hasn't heard of this knowledge or she refutes this knowledge. Well, Apollos, obviously, he did not refute the knowledge that came to him, but he could have been that person that said, no, no, this is, no, I, I don't, I haven't heard that. I don't want to hear that. No, I'm going to stay right here and teach this baptism of John. I'm going to preach the baptism of John. I don't want no more new knowledge. Well, see, that's where motivating you to win is. She does not want any new knowledge. All she wants is what she was taught under that kingdom program. And she's just not interested in entertaining the thought that somebody could be saved by grace. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's my earnest plea. Allow the body of Christ, the members, we're supposed to be helping one another. Allow us to catch you up to speed, motivating you to win. Catch you up to speed so that you can affect more people under the right gospel. We want to bring motivating you to win into right division. Get her out of the Old Testament. And I mean, when you talk about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, some people, they can't even grasp, they can't even grasp what that means. It's like, no, this is New Testament. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, it says New Testament. But I'm telling you, that's not the New Testament because Jesus was still alive and the law was still in full effect, right? Jesus was, as long as Jesus was alive during his earthly ministry in the flesh, the law was in full swing and Jesus practiced the law and then Jesus fulfilled the law. And that's all we want to do. Get her away from these erroneous teachings. Get her up to speed. Help her to transition. We're not going to ridicule her in any way because she might be embarrassed that she was teaching in error. And that might, and I mean, a person with her passion, you know, that would really, really, that would really hurt her because she, you can clearly see that she gives it her all. And to know that she was teaching the wrong gospel before God, that would really, that would really hurt her a lot. I mean, you can just, you know, that she's a passionate type of person. You can just uh, see how that would play out. But there's no judgment coming from us, the body of Christ, because that's not the, we're supposed to strengthen the brethren where he's weak, not ridicule. That's not what we're doing here, especially on my channel. I mean, I have fun. Sometimes things are humorous and I find myself laughing out loud, but hey, that's just my personality. And there's no harm done because I'm not mocking. I'm not making fun of nobody. But sometimes their actions make me laugh. Okay? It's funny. So that's all we want to do. And so what we're going to do, we're just going to continue to pray for our sister, motivating you to win. And uh, if she makes the transition, we want to help her make that transition. And we hope that she embraces that transition. And it's going to take a load off of her heart and mind. I know this to be true because this is the way it happened for me. And so anyway, I want to say God bless you all. Thank you for, uh, I'm sure that I have spent almost an hour, but hey, you're worth it. I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. And I hope these little nuggets will help someone who's struggling in their faith. So God bless you all. Enjoy the rest of your day. We shall meet again. In Jesus' name.